While we have all grown to love the home planet of Subnautica's 4546B with all its weird creatures and underground caves, a lot of players in the community are still wondering what Earth in Subnautica is actually like. We know Subnautica takes place far into the future with faster than light travel, multiple new alien species discovered, and massive organizations that span multiple star systems. But in all of this, there's basically no mention of Earth in any of the game's lore. And considering we play as humans, you would think our natural birthplace in the stars would play a bigger role. Well, the reason for its absence may be more sad than you thought. If we take a look at the radiation suit description in-game, at the very end of the logs there's a tag phrase, a necessary precaution in a post-MAD world. For those that don't know, MAD is actually an acronym for Mutually Assured Destruction and was a big talking point during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, when fears of nuclear winter and the end of Earth as we know it were high. Considering we find this phrase on the radiation suit specifically, it seems quite likely that Earth and Subnautica actually fell during an all-out nuclear war. On top of this, in the Cuttlefish PDA entry in-game, at one point it is noted that, as observed in Earth's dolphins before their extinction. This once again lends credence to the idea that Earth has been obliterated, but the most damning evidence of all actually comes from an Altera PDA entry we find in game as well. During the expansion, Altera supplied arms to all sides, acquiring and housing a vast colonist workforce, and making the transition from manufacturer to corporate state. Altera's threat to cease trade was one of the turning points in the conflict, bringing about the end of hostilities and signing of the Charter. Based on this evidence, it seems clear that the fate of Earth in Subnautica is less than stellar. In fact, I tried to find more evidence of this based on the natural selection lore as well, considering they take place in the same universe, but I wasn't able to find anything. So if any of you guys know anything about that universe, feel free to comment down below. Many people remember the building where Arasaka attacks Hanako and Takamura, potentially taking Takamura's life based on the player's actions. But for most players, they probably missed the much more interesting part of this building. You see, if you make your way upstairs in this seemingly rundown and nonchalant building, you eventually may stumble upon a partially opened door, that being room 301. When you first walk up, you notice a large blue light glow emitting from the room, and upon closer inspection and peering through the small crack in the door, you see what looks to be scribbles all over the walls. Unfortunately, there is no way to get into this room besides glitching through the door, but if you manage to do so, you are met with a haunting scene. The walls are littered with incoherent writings and shapes, and on the ground in the center of the room is a wrench with blood drenched around it. A large heap of file holders are held up in the corner of the room, and right on the center of the back wall, in giant lettering, is the phrase, I am not me, with ink and potentially blood splattered everywhere. Something truly haunting has happened in this room, and some other users online have even reported hearing faint screams when near here, as well as the sounds of shattering glass. It's unclear if this was cut content from maybe a quest involving River or Cyber Psycho, or just an easter egg from the devs, but either way, it's something beyond horrific that has happened in this room, and the building that contains it. Even more creepily is the significance of the number 301. You see, in many religious sects, the number 301 signifies the coming of a hellish angel and further parallels to our own life can be drawn to organizations like Cicada 3301, which famously created well-known cryptography puzzles online for recruiting the smartest minds of our generation, only to disappear later without even giving people an idea of who they were. In terms of places in Cyberpunk 2077 that likely have more than meets the eye, Room 301 is certainly a place of such intrigue. One of the best parts of the Witcher series is just how varied the locations are. And that's even excluding the multiverse and its infinite amount of otherworldly finds. Because even just on the continent, there's so much to explore and love. And probably the most beautiful, vibrant, and potentially unique places in all of the Witcher series we've seen so far at least, is Toussaint. 
Featured in the Blood and Wine DLC for The Witcher 3, Tassant is almost a fairy tale come to life, with giant and sprawling vistas, lush greenery as far as I can see, and massive mountains and towns bustling with life. The entire zone just gives off a feeling of abundance and health, and it's in stark contrast to the more melancholy tones we see almost everywhere else in the series, a great change of pace for a lot of fans. But while on the surface Tassant seems to be a dream location with no faults, beneath it all lie some of the most disturbing creatures and characters, and potentially even a coming Armageddon no one's prepared for. You see, one of the reasons Tucson is so wealthy and abundant, and also why so much of the wildlife is so lush, is because as we learn from the books, the entire area is absolutely littered with volcanic soil. And for those of you that don't know, oftentimes volcanic soil is super rich in minerals that are vital in replenishing the dirt, meaning some of the best crop yields and most beautiful places even on Earth are the result of massive volcanic eruptions long ago. And in the case of Tassant, it very much seems this is the case. Where it gets concerning though is just how much of the duchy is covered in this abundant soil of the past. It isn't just the mountains or close to them, it seems to be almost the entire area itself that has been affected, and this suggests that when the volcano did erupt, it must have been an event of massive and almost unimaginable proportions. There's further evidence too of this in-game if we look at Mount Gorgon, the tallest peak in Tucson. It seems to be reminiscent of Mount St. Helens after its famed eruption that sent shockwaves around the world in our real lives. Could this be CD Projekt Red trying to signal to us that this peak may be hiding a sinister past? We know too in game that Mount Gorgon is usually associated with pure evil, and has been a symbol of bad omens for the people of Toussaint for many years now. Potentially Toussaint itself could actually be one huge caldera, with molten magma flowing just underneath the surface in all of the duchy, all being controlled by some evil force at the helm of Mount Gorgon simply biding its time until the next massive eruption, which this time could be so large it could send the entire continent back into the Stone Ages. It's crazy to think that in a world full of blood-sucking vampires, multi-dimensional unicorn gods, and this absolute unit, that maybe the most terrifying thing of all is just Mother Nature itself. One of the coolest features of every Mass Effect game is the galaxy map. It allows players to not only traverse their way to new systems and planets, but also to simply read up on a lot of lore on the places we get to go. Most of the time this lore is pretty basic and uneventful filler that tells some basic background story of what's happening on this planet. But two specific planets in the series have a much more interesting background. The first one's from Mass Effect 3, called Ploba. Scans reveal that there is a baffling amount of strange and giant megastructures on the surface that are too regular in pattern to be explained away as standard geography. Many scientists have suggested that Ploba may in fact be a planet-sized supercomputer being housed in these megastructures, or a reaper hiding ground used to indoctrinate nearby species. Either way, we may never know. The next planet is Logan, from Mass Effect 1. Similar to Ploba, this gas giant was surveyed by scientist teams and it was discovered that several large and distinct objects were on the surface of the planet. However, even more horrifying in this case, the objects always immediately disappeared out of thin air when observed, and no answers or ideas have yet been brought forth as to what has happened with this phenomenon. For any new Souls players in the series, finding hidden messages from other players throughout the world would have started as a relief, until you realized in many cases, these messages left by other players were pranks more often than not. Many times, asking players to jump, roll, hit, and do other things that would result in their death, or even worse, them feeling stupid. Also, the community can get a good laugh. But sometimes messages like this can result in finding hidden rooms and treasure, and because of the propensity of FromSoft to include hidden mechanics like this in their games, some players try anything to find new locations. This was taken to a whole new level though, when it was discovered that there is a wall in Volcano Manor that if hit 50 times consecutively, would suddenly disappear, letting players into a room they would already have had access to from another door just on the left. But it still sent the community into an absolute frenzy, after all, now there was definitive proof that these ultra-secret doors did in fact exist in-game. To this day, many players are still hitting walls all across the lands between, in an attempt to find the next big hidden secret. And knowing FromSoft, there might just be some massive discoveries yet to be made. 
It's one of the most fun parts of FromSoft games that really lends to a strong sense of community as the player base bands together to find these new discoveries. And I really wish more games had things like this. One of my personal favorite vaults in the entire Fallout franchise is Vault 108, affectionately known as the Gary Vault. Located in the wilderness of Fallout 3 lies a mysterious door hidden behind a large rock formation. When you first enter, you find a dead body on the ground, and even more interestingly, a vault door left completely wide open. As you step inside, you are met with a scene of horror. Blood marks cover the walls, furniture is thrown around, and the generators powering the vault are completely offline. You find dead wastelander bodies of those trying to loot the facility all over. But the true horror comes when you find the body labeled Gary42 after just being attacked by an extremely similar looking person named Gary33. As you make your way deeper into the vault, you slowly uncover that it is littered with an army of clones of this one man, Gary, all hilariously shouting at you the entire time. <laughs> Gary! And if you have the courage to go even deeper into this twisted vault, you eventually uncover that a scientist was performing experiments of cloning, and even find a sectioned off female dorm blocked by tons of cabinets, suggesting that at one point they had barricaded themselves inside, presumably to protect themselves from men who can't stop shouting their name. The true intrigue though comes if you go to the Pentagon in Fallout 3 because it's here we can open top secret terminal information on multiple vaults, including Vault 108. The vault was originally set to perform experiments in cloning over a span of 30 years, but the generators were only specced for 20. We can find multiple reports of complaints from the vault residents, but all were shot down by the vault tech higher ups. On top of this, the original overseer, which for those of you who don't know is essentially the leader of any vault, was known to have cancer, and we can find discussions estimating his death after three years, followed up by a journal entry stating, these two events should combine to allow a proper catalyst that allows this project to continue as planned. So something was going on in this vault that most people living there weren't aware of, and it leads us to even more questions than it answers. What were these cloning experiments for? How did so many clones survive for so long? Were the experiments to find immortality? And why are there female dorms but no male dorms? Could it be as YouTuber Oxhorn postulates that the true experiment of the vault was putting a large group of females all with one cloned male to see what happens? Either way, it's clear that at some point the Gary clones started to become more and more aggressive, and with time eventually overtook the vault which coincidentally we see in the Pentagon logs stocked with three times the normal amount of munitions. So maybe when the generators turned off, the Garys all grabbed the guns and started screaming Gary while massacring the entire vault and its inhabitants. A horrifying idea to think about. <laughs>